Hello, nice to, to be here with you again. We're going to start our fourth lecture in mineral processing. And this course is provided by Destination Brazil, an initiative from Andifs. And today we're going to talk about comminution, about mineral breakage, or about grinding. It's all synonym. What we want to do is reduce the size of our material. And in order to do this, we have some special machines designed for this. But one thing that you guys need to consider right now is, according to the feed of this machine, I'm going to have different machines. That's the first thing that we have to keep in mind, okay? So if we're talking about coarse particles, I'm not going to throw this inside of a meal. Okay? It's just not going to happen. Why? Because you're going to waste a lot of energy and you're not going to have the the product that you want okay so normally what is going to happen is you're going to start first with grinding and then we're going to have like one or two steps of grinding and then you are able to feed your material is for to a meal okay and then you can have like one or two meals again and then your material is normally ready to go to the next stage okay but before we start to to discuss the machines and how the machines work let's start a little bit trying to answer this question why should we break mineral particles okay why this question is important because if you consider the amount of energy that we spend in a mineral processing plant something around 80 80 percent of all energy is going to be used only in our meals so we talk about a lot of energy in order to reduce particle size okay in order to break this material and then we have to be extra clear why we want to do this okay so i brought you this example this is a granite okay i think it's pretty straightforward every time that we take a look at this if it's not an animal it's probably a granite okay but consider this imagine just for a moment imagine that the black particles in this picture are the mineral that we want to sell okay that's the our or that's the mineral under our interests okay so we want to produce just this material so we have to concentrate this as you can see we have a lot of black spots but we also have different colors together with the black part okay and nobody is going to crush this granite in order to separate these particles but just consider this example and i took a granite just because it's quite hard to break this material and to have only the black particles and only the other colors normally when i break this i break everything and i remaining have particles with mixed colors okay so the first thing that we want to consider is how can i concentrate the black particles without breaking it's impossible okay i can just take a, a tool and go to my granite and carve the black particles out of it it's not gonna work okay just remember our last lecture we're gonna use big machines big trucks big loaders and so on so it's impossible just doing this by hand and on the other side it's going to be extremely expensive just to product to, to process this by hand okay so we have to skip this let's not even consider this so the first thing that we have to keep in mind is mineral liberation over here we have an example coming from barry will's book okay and consider that this is our granite and the particles a are the particles that we want to sell they're marketable particles so if i try to bre break this big particle over here i'm gonna have this four other particles over here okay so let's see the first one we have a lot of black material our desired material but we still have a small part of white material on that other one we have more of the other white material the picture tree or the particle tree it's completely different now we have a white matrix and on this matrix i have our material okay our desired material and the fourth is the opposite of the first one okay i have just a small amount of the material that i want and the large part part of this material it's gang mineral so let's give uh, this element some names okay so let's consider that the blackish particle or the brownish particle it's hematite and the white part over here it's quartz so i'm gonna just type ktz 
okay so consider this we're going to take this material and we go into flotation so we're going to add some chemicals and i'm going to start to separate the materials that are hematite like from the materials that are quartz like in a reverse flotation a cationic reverse flotation i'm going to float quartz and i'm going to depress hematite so if i take a look at the first particle probably that's not going to float that particle is going to sink Okay, so that's okay. This particle is going to end up in my final concentrate. But just take a look. This particle is not 100% hematite. And we're going to have this contamination in our final product. So that's the first thing we have to consider. It's quite virtually impossible to have 100% of co hematite concentrate. We're always going to have a little bit of quartz in this concentrate. Why? Because we're not going to achieve 100% of all my particles only composed by hematite. We're going to have different degrees of association and this association it's real and it's quite difficult not to have this. Okay, so let's go to particle number two. Now it's almost 50-50. So again, we have a 50-50 chance of end up with this particle or with the other quartz particles or in our concentrate. Nevertheless, or I'm going to lose hematite, or I'm going to have this material doping my concentrate, lowering my grade. But particle number three, definitely I'm going to lose the material. If I want to have this material, if I want to recover this material, then I have to break even more this part. Okay? The size is not adequate yet. And if we consider particle number four, that's a nightmare. Okay, definitely I have to keep grinding or keep milling that particle. Or I have to consider just to deliver this to the next stage and then we're going to have like a chemical attack. If I don't attack chemically this particle, I will not be able to recover it. It's just too small liberation. Okay, so again, let's take a look at this other picture over here in the bottom part. So we have this matrix and we have a lot of gang mineral and inside of the gang I have an intrepid particle of the mineral that I want to concentrate over here. Okay, so if I didn't break this, I would never going to release this material. Okay, so that's the first uh, goal of mineral breakage or mineral comminution. It's to liberate particles. And when I take a look at this graphic over here, this graphic it's quite important for us because nowadays we have a methodology to analyze materials called it MLA, which stands for Mineral Liberation Analyze. Actually, this name comes from a software developed by one manufacturer, but we can have a quick idea on how this works. I'm going to use an SEM, a scanning electron microscope, and I'm going just to shoot. I'm going to literally shoot electrons, electrons on my sample, and I'm going to see the interactions between that uh, electric field and my sample. So I'm going to have the chemical composition of many points of my sample. And then I start to make a map. And literally, I'm going to make a um, whole mapping of my sample. And analyzing this mapping, I'm going to come to this graphic. So this graphic correlates for me the size of the particles and how much is going to be the liberation degree of our material. So one thing it's quite understandable that if I have very, very small particles, then probably I have 100% liberation. And that's true. And that's why I'm over here, almost 100%. And if I have only coarse particles, probably I have 0% of liberation. So what is the definition of liberation? Is the amount of material in one specifically particle size, okay, that we have the number of liberated particles or 100% particles that I want to concentrate divided by the amount of particles that I have in that fraction. So in this case, I don't have a single particle that is not associated, associated with gang minerals. Okay? So again, this is quite un easy to understand. So if I go to a coarse fraction, then I'm going to have almost 0% or even 0% of mineral liberation. And if I keep grinding, 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 milling our material, we're going to eventually reach a very high level of liberation, probably something near 100%. Definitely not 100%, but near it. So the second reason that I'm going to come in our material is to increase the surface area. 
okay so again maybe i'm gonna have another com another stage of concentration maybe not probably i'm just gonna have this concentration nowadays but this is going to be our next lecture but anyhow in some cases i want to increase the surface area why because i'm gonna attack chemically our material and this representation over here just show you guys something quite easy to understand that is if i just consider a cube and this cube has uh, a size of u just like unity the surface area is going to be six times u square okay if i'm going to calculate the volume is going to be u cubic and if i make this surface slash volume ratio what i'm going to have is six to one so i have six times the area that i have one part of volume so if i just cut down our material i'm gonna see what the volume is going to be the same i'm gonna have a lot of extra particles that's for sure i'm going to increase the number of particles but the volume is going to remain the same so everybody who played with lego before just understand that easily i just take the lego and just assemble the lego and the volume is exactly the same okay but the surface area is a completely different story so the surface area just keep growing and growing and growing okay so again if you want to have your material in a chemical process probably you are going to need surface area okay and that's why we go for combination okay uh, another thing that we have to be quite clear is it's quite difficult to increase our surface area up to a certain point okay so let's try to say this in another way it's easy to break minerals but up to a certain point so if i want just to keep grinding our material i'm gonna need eventually even and even and even more energy and in the end i'm gonna spend a lot of energy i'm and i'm not gonna decrease the particle size so it's difficult for us to produce nanomaterial if I take just a mineral and go to the a nano world, it's quite difficult. So micrometers, it's okay. Nanometers, not so much. Okay. So when we discuss this with people from uh, material science or materials engineering, they always ask us, can you mill something for me? Can you put this in your meal? I said, yeah, definitely. And they come to us with like 10 grams of material or 20 grams, and they want us to mill up to, I don't know, 100 nanometers. So I can't do this, okay? literally, I can't do this. And I'm gonna show you guys why, okay? So this picture over here, it's a quite regular picture of a beach in Europe, but that's nothing that we have in Brazil. It's the opposite. We have sand beaches in Brazil, not rock beaches. In some points, we can even have some rock beaches, but that's not regular, okay? But take a look at this picture. This is actually something real. Someone just went there and took this picture. As you can see, we have many different colors, that's for sure, but we have also different particle size. So just consider this. How can I work with a material in such a way, in such particle size distribution? It's quite difficult. Okay, just develop a route that you can take this material as it is and just separate it. It's visually impossible so i have to separate okay so coarse particles go this way medium particles go this way and fine particles please take this way and then i can prepare a route for this and then i can increase my recovery my grades and so on okay so our focus right now is to prepare our material or to another stage probably concentration or even to sell it okay who's gonna want to buy something like this it's normally not the case. Probably people want to buy small gravels, medium gravels, or big gravels, and not this assemble of gravels. Okay, so that's the three main reasons that we're gonna have in order to communicate our material. So I bought this picture just to show you guys the glass on it. Okay, can you see a glass particle in this picture? Yeah, it's right here, right? So we have glass in the middle of our beach. And this is something that we can actually or eventually end up doing. We have a lot of particles and we have to go there and just pick one in the middle of many others. So it's literally 
a needle in a haystack. And this one, for example, could be a golden nugget or could be a diamond. Nevertheless, I have to go there and collect this. And if this particle is directly attached or connected to another one, then we have to break it free. Okay, and we can't do this if we don't use a communication station. Okay, so I guess after all these examples, it's a little bit clear for us why we're going to start communication. But again, I have another picture that I want to discuss with you guys. This is again quite common in mines. Okay, so you can see that we have big chunk of rocks, small chunk of rocks, and then we have something like sand or a lot of different sizes okay and how can i go there and start something with this material start to process this material if i have such a huge distribution okay so we have to grind it. and there is even another reason that normally books just don't mention but it's really important for us to consider it's the homogenization of the material okay so normally we're going to grind the material in order to obtain an homogen homogeneous sample and with this homogeneous sample then we can start mineral processing okay then we can start concentration okay again we can see some iron oxides in this picture and i can see on the other hand particles that doesn't have anything with iron ore so we have to communicate everything together in order to eventually separate those phases okay this is a, another chart it is coming also from many books so different books is going to show you the same chart this one specifically i collect from a paper you can see the reference down below but this is standard okay this is nothing new and this picture is showing us what on the left hand side we can see three different particles and the main particle the started particle is the same so i'm going to grind this material using three different mechanics so the first thing that I'm going to try to do is break by abrasion, abrasion, okay, or by stressing the material, and I'm going to do this localized. So we're just going to apply friction. So consider this, okay? I just want to remove a small piece of my nail. So I'm going to take what? I'm going to take something like a, a paper sand or something like that, and I'm just going to apply this friction, and I'm going to get rid of my nail, okay? Another thing that I can do is I can use compression. Okay, so I'm going to take like a, a splicer or something like that, and I'm going to press it and definitely I'm going to break it. And the other thing that I can do, not with my fingernail, but we can do this with minerals is just to use impact. So I'm going to shatter our material. So if we take a look about the spent energy, the, the way that I'm going to break my material using more energy is shattering our material. On the second case is by cleverage, okay, or compression. And the, the way that I'm going to break my material and I'm going to save energy is by shearing, okay, is by abrasion. But consider one thing, okay, and this is quite important. If I want to produce all of my material in one specific particle size, then probably this arrow is going to be on the other way around. Okay, it's going to be pointing up and not down anymore. What I mean with this is, if I take a big chunk of rock and just use a sledgehammer, okay, just like Thor and bah, slash our rock, probably I'm gonna break everything. I'm gonna have a lot of small particles and I'm gonna use almost nothing of it. Okay, so if I go there on the other hand and take something like to apply uh, shear, I'm going to stay there forever literally forever and i'm going to use a lot of energy and in the end i'm just going to have a small amount of powder okay so we have to keep that in mind if i have big blocks like coarse particles just go for shattering those so if you have small particles definitely go to localize it stressing or abrasion or even shearing and then you're going to have a better result okay so depends on what you have in your hands at the beginning and then you can take a look what you're going to produce in the end and that's what is represented on your right hand side okay so this is the feed material it's just a reference point over here because it's just one single particle so 
doesn't make a lot of sense to talk about quantity uh, to plot a histogram. So if I go by shattering, that's what I'm going to receive. A lot of particles go into a, a Gaussian distribution and I have my mean over here and I have a huge standard deviation, okay? On the other hand, if I go to cleavage, we're gonna have something like this as a mean. So you can take a look at this and definitely you can correlate with those elements, those particles right over here. So in this case, I'm going to have coarser particles being produced after the breakage. But on the other hand, the standard deviation is going to decrease. Okay. And if I go to abrasion, abrasion, for example, I'm going to have one, probably one big particle, okay, quite representative, but big particle and a lot of fine particles over here. So now I have a bimodal distribution because I have two means and two standard deviations. Okay, so when I, we take a look at this, we can start to thinking what my machine is going to deliver me. Because if I can just to see what is the mechanics that's going to be applied and how the energy is going to be exchanged in our machine, then I can remember this graphic and said, mm, okay, now I know how a jaw crusher works. Okay, that's the first machine that we're going to talk about. It. And that's this machine. Okay, so as you know, guys, the human beings, we have some genius among us, like 8%, 6%, this name, this number, sorry, it changed a lot, but we very, very clever with analogy. So we can see one thing working and we can just adapt to our reality and come to a very clever machine, just like this one. This machine has more than 100 years old. We have some difference. I'm gonna show you guys. We have at least three different types of jaw crusher. But what was the source of inspiration for this machine? Our jaws, okay? So we have one fixed jaw that would be our upper jaw, and we have a moving jaw that is going to be our lower jaw. In this equipment, we have this one, and this one is the static jaw, okay, right here. And the other side, we have this one, okay? I'm going to represent down here. This is the dynamic jaw, okay? So this is the jaw that is moving. So we have this flywheel over here. It's going to be attached to the engine. And this engine is going to transfer energy for the flywheel. And we have an eccentric shaft over here. And then we have this movement from one side to the other, okay? So this machine is going to do something like this, okay? And I can show you a little bit better in this slide. And actually in here, we have two different jaw crusher types. On your left hand side, we have which nowadays is the standard for jaw crusher. It's the call or so-called 1x jaw crusher. And you're on your right hand side, we have a dodge jaw crusher. What is the difference between these two? Okay, as you can see, we still have a flywheel, both of those, but the difference is the movement. As you can see on the dodge, Okay, so just take a look at this part over here. You have more movement down here than what we have upper there, okay? And then you're gonna say, oh, pretty much is the same. We have more movement over here. Yes, but in this machine, in just one axis, over here, we have a movement like this. It's just like a, an ellipsis. And over here, it's more round movement. And over here, it's just like this we have just the jaw crusher coming together and then going back we don't have this component we don't have this movement right here so on your right hand side you have just compression okay it's just this on the, on the left hand side you have another component you have compression but you have also shearing okay so now we have two different mechanisms coming together we compress and then we use friction Okay, and then we break our material differently than what we can do on the Dodge jaw crusher. And to be completely honest, it's quite difficult nowadays just to buy a Dodge jaw crusher. You can even find nowadays this one, which is called Blake jaw crusher. Well, let's see why my video is not working. Now, now it's working. As you can see over here, in this case, we have not just one, but we have 
two axes, okay? So the difference between the Blake Jaw Crusher for the other two ones is this. And as you can see over here, let me play it again. Over here, you can see we have one axis, which would be this one, okay? And we have this other axis over here. So this one is called two axis jaw crush, okay? We have another difference. I'm gonna come to this in a few minutes, but let's play it again and just take a look at the movement of the jaws, okay? And you're gonna see that is completely different. So in this case, our strength is going to be always on the base. On the top, you don't have any movement, okay? So we have just this kind of movement on the top and on the bottom of our jaw crush. So coming back over here, I just want to call your attention to this beauty over here. So this part of the equipment, we have another one over here. This is quite important for us. This is this equipment over here. This is called a togo plate, okay? So what is this togo plate? If something went wrong, with your jaw crusher for example you have a metallic body inside of it and this is a foreign body it doesn't supposed to be there i have to compress everything but then again i have a metallic body over there so the torque in our engine is going to keep going up up and eventually i can even blow my engine off to avoid this to happen i have the togo plate what is going to happen it's quite simple it's going to break okay so if you can imagine this is, would be like a fuse okay this is a mechanical fuse so if i have a problem breaking our, our material it's too heavy it's too difficult to break it so the togo plate is going to go off okay it's just going to break and when you break a togo plate what's happened is you instantly open your jaw okay it's just like what happened with us when you break your jaw your mouth just fell down and you just keep your mouth open all the time so that's what is going to happen right here. You're going to blow the toggle plate. It's going to break the toggle plate and it's just going to open and remains open. Okay. And the flywheel is just going to stay crazy over there, flying crazy, but nothing happened. Okay. So in here we have one toggle plate. As you can see over here, we just have another toggle plate, just one toggle. And to, for this kind of jaw crusher, we have not just one over here, but we have a second one over here okay nowadays applications for this jaw crushes is limited just for coal okay normally we break coal using this equipment it's interesting because it can break coal in order to liberate more of the coal particles so that's why we end up choosing this kind of crusher okay so let's move on to a different kind of crusher okay the first one we can use as a primary crusher what is that means? Means that we can take our material, run off mine, big chunk of particles, and just feed directly to the jaw crusher. Okay, not all crushers can do this feature, but jaw crusher it can do this. Okay. On the other hand, this one, gyratory crusher, also can do the same trick. Okay. So I can feed big chunks of rocks to this guy over here. And if you take a look on my YouTube channel, you can see one of these working here in Brazil. It's quite beautiful to take a look at that. It's breaking iron ore in, in Minas Gerais, in Vale. But what is the difference between this crusher and the next one that I'm going to show you? Exactly this structure over here, and it's called spider. Okay, so this is spider on the top. It's going to support the whole axis that is going to be below and the movement of this X is going to actually grind our material. So in those two pictures, also coming from ThyssenKrupp group, you can see two different gyratory crushes, both from the same company. Okay. So taking a look at this picture, you can imagine what we're talking about. Do you remember last lecture? So this is one of the equipment that we had over there just to prepare our ground our uh, our mine okay just to clean everything the loader is not over here but we have a drill equipment over here another one over here an suv over here so you can take a look at the size so that big trucks they are coming here and here and we have already one here and the second one here 
and take a look they both are going to feed together the same crusher okay so now we have a crusher that is able to break not one but two trucks at the same time so it has to be an enormous uh, grinder right enormous equipment enormous crusher so it's like a titan crusher and you can take a look at this for example this would be like three meters okay three meters store so we're talking about one store two store three four five it's like a building of five stars there's nothing small okay so this is the giratory crusher simple scene inside we just saw the spider on the top of it okay but the machine it's quite big below also and i was talking to you about the axis so again the x is going to be supported over here the motion is driven by this other x over here and we have a movement not only circular but probably something like ellipses like this when you take a look in 2d in 3d you're gonna see the whole movement of the equipment so the side cap or the upper cap sorry it's called spider cap because people think it looks like a spider I'm not sure if i can see a spider over there but that's the name okay and as you can see over here we have this gate on the top and just a small gap on the bottom okay and when we have the movement of this x it's going to close on one side and it's going to move farther from the other side so in this moment we have production going down over here and material being break over here okay so when we take a look at some videos in the future you're going to see this better and you're going to have a better understanding about this why because we have two similar machines we have this primary grinder okay would be the gyratory grinder and then we have a spider on top of this and then we have a different machine that we don't have a spider we have almost the same mechanism and energy driving but it's a little bit different because we don't have the spider and then we don't have a primary crusher we have a secondary crusher okay so now we already took our material run of mine we fed the first machine and then we took the product of this first machine and fed to a second okay and that's why we have a secondary grinder and not a primary one and in here you can see one over here and the second one over here those are cone crushes okay so as you can see over here in these two animations one on the right side i know for sure that coming from the matsu material you can see that the movement that our machine is going to do is the same movement that we had on the other one on the gyratory crusher but we don't have a spider anymore so in this guy over here this is not the spider this is the, just a device in order to feed the material a little bit slower inside of the chamber but definitely we, we don't have a spider okay so in here it's more clear that it's completely empty Okay, we just go there and throw our material inside and it's instantly breaking okay so this is quite a clever machine if you compare with the jaw crusher okay so the energy driven mechanism is completely different so that's why we can tackle different kind of materials for example if i try to put some slimes on the jaw crusher it's terrible because slimes for them is just like bubble gum it's gonna do things like this and in the end we have zero particle breakage okay why because of how the machine was designed but on the other hand if you take the same material and if you feed a con crusher then you're gonna have particles being break okay so again in here you have to choose and you have to choose wisely because you're not gonna have a lot of money to choose today one machine in the nearest future like two years ah okay i'm fed up with jaw crusher i'm gonna change to a con crusher and your boss is gonna say no 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 if you have a jaw crusher you have a jaw crusher probably for life okay you're gonna marry this guy and you're gonna stay with this for a long time so choose your machine very very wisely okay this picture i took here in catalon this is the first equipment that we had when we arrived at the Copebras, a phosphate producing company. And that's a slightly different machine. Okay, so if you look at the design of this machine, I know it's quite strange when you take a look at this. It's nothing related with jaw crusher, 
gyratory crusher of cone crusher because this is a hammer crusher okay so i'm gonna move forward a little bit and i'm gonna come back to this picture but let's see how it works okay so now we have one axis and this axis is a horizontal axis and it's going to be spinning not to break directly our material but i'm going to be spinning our axe in order to give momentum to a series of hammers okay and then the mineral is going to be falling and the hammer is going to collide directly to the mineral particle and then we're going to have the mineral breakage okay the mineral can break by the directly impact with the hammer but in some cases you just can't do this so you're just gonna do something like baseball you're gonna hit your mineral and you're gonna throw your mineral away so if you have a home run what you're gonna have is your mineral going to hit these plates over here or plates over here or even these plates over here so that's why you have these systems over here so what are we going over what were we seeing over there is something just to receive the impact okay dissipate the energy and put the plate back where it belongs okay so it's the suspension it's a suspension system just like your bike your motorcycle or even your car so if we come back just for a second the suspensions are here okay you can see over here you can see in here and two more over here okay so if you come to a, a mineral processing plant and if you see this suspensions over there said, oh, okay i know which machine is this this is definitely definitely hammer crusher okay and here it is again working for us okay again people depending on your uh, on your mineral it, that machine is going to be awesome it's going to be the best machine for you to break your minerals part depending on what you have in hand that's going to be terrible your material is going to feed this machine and eventually you can have hammer breaks and you can have like plates of the material just go inside and you just can't break it okay so again consider to choose wisely your your equipment because the, according to the equipment is going to be your recipe to success or your recipe to failure or catastrophic failure okay so this is one option ah i am going to show you this later on also for another reason okay so let's see something our ore is being fed over here so we have the particles breaking over here and then what do you have over here we have a belt okay we have a transport belt so this situation it's becoming every day more normal and common and what we can see over here i have a, a crusher inside our pit okay just like like i showed you before this is just to express this okay so just to put a little bit more emphasis even now it's still like a taboo people don't want to talk about this they have this feeling that we have to take the material out of the mine and not to bring equipments inside of the mine but nowadays this is becoming quite common okay even in brazil and other third world countries you have assembles like this you just put your machine inside of your pit and you just break it and then you transport if you consider underground mines this is quite normal and even simple but when you talk about overground mine open pit mine people don't like this the situation at least not everywhere okay but again this is changing just another comparison between jaw crusher and hammer crusher you can see over here they are completely different okay and the way that they use to break material is completely different so again choose wisely which machine you want to buy okay and in here i bring something to you quite different quite important also and then i'm gonna try to talk to you about this machine twice because this machine is called HPGR, high pressure grinding rows. And these rows, they can be used not only as a crusher, but also as a mill. Okay. So we can have this machine change position. Okay. You can put this after the, the primary crusher and then before the mill, or you can even push it a little way further and then you can have this material 
being used as a meal. We don't normally we use this kind of profile for the rolls. Okay, this is more like a shredder, so this is quite regular for recycling. But nevertheless, if you have a material that breaks better with this kind of shredder, so why not use it? Okay, be my guest and choose wisely what is better for you. So I have a video over here that I want to show you guys. And I uh, think it, it's a very good movie because they, they tackle the problems that we have nowadays. Okay. So energy cost, we need to innovate. So we need to bring more science into communication. And don't get me wrong, we have lots and lots of simulators and people that are actually doing simulation, but we need different machines. So that's what this machine is supposedly being bringing to us. Okay. More efficiency. Okay. Maximum productivity and low downtime. So as you can see over here, the material is feeding the equipment and then the rows can do all the rest. Okay. And actually this AGPGR, they are quite clever machine because you can break your minerals in, in a very good way by compression. And also you have some shear on it. But the thing is you increase a lot the liberation of the material. So if you just break the material in the jaw crusher, you're not going to end up having a good liberation. But if you use an AGPGR, then you do have an increase in liberation. Okay. So as you can see, 15% of energy efficiency and reduce of circuit late loading. And we're going to talk more about this kind of load in our circuit. But then again, it's quite interesting machine. Okay. And it's not a new machine. It has been around for like a decade or so, but nowadays people are paying a lot more attention to the AGPGR than in the past. Okay. So why not to consider this as one of your machines? Okay. So a good move, right? In here, we have another equipment that is quite new compared to the other ones, to the first one. And this one, it's called VSI Mu. And VSI stands for Vertical Shaft Impactor. Okay. And if you come to a Brazilian salesman, he's going to tell you that this is not a meal. This is actually a crusher. So again, in here, we're not talking about primary crushing anymore. We're talking about secondary crushers and so on. And that's why you can even have something quite close to a meal coming from this machine. Okay. So this machine, it's again quite clever it's new so people spend a lot of time trying to come out with different ideas to different designs and people had this idea how about we have an x a vertical one not horizontal anymore and i like that idea of hammering our material of having this impact with our material but instead of having a hammer and just put the hammer in direct contact with our minerals, why not just try to break mineral against mineral? Okay. And that's what we have in this machine. So we have this rotation bed over here. This is our rotor. Part of the minerals are going to come this way. It's going to be in this plate, this rotating plate, and it's going to be thrown away in this direction. Okay. And as you can see over here, we have a lot of the same ore just stored over, started over here because why? Part of the material is going to come here and it's going to be fed over here. Okay. So part of the material is going to come here and it's going to be fed on this part of the, the equipment. So we have material moving on the outer side of the equipment, on the other part of the equipment, everything inside of it. And we have material flowing directly down. So this material that is coming down is going to be projected against the material that's moving on the outer part of the, of the machine. And then we have our grind. Why? Because we're going to have mineral breaking against mineral. So it's quite clever uh, situation. It's a quite clever idea and how we can do this. Okay. So I want to show you guys briefly about the truckless system. As you can see over here, we don't have trucks. 
Okay, so the material comes run off the mine. Actually, we're inside the mine all the time, but we have a loader, and the loader is just going to blink over here. Okay, as you can see, we have just blink blinking loader. So the loader is going to feed the material over here. This material comes to here, and this is a hammer crusher, and then the material is going to flow over here, and the small, the fine particles can be picked up over here or piled over here. So what we can see over here, another equipment over here, and because of this, we know for sure that is the second hammer crusher. And then the material keep flowing over here up to this part on the top. Sorry, over here. Oh, where I'm drawing. Sorry, it's not, I'm not sure what has happened, but my pen stopped to work. Oh, now it's back over here on the top. And then this is a sieving. Okay, then we have classification. So the coarser particles come here, coarser. This is the middlings. Okay, and then the fine particles come where? In this case, part of the material is coming back over here to this area, probably to be regrinded. Okay, so in the end of the process, I just want to have the very fine particles over here, the middlings over here, and the coarse particles. This is supposed to be a C. Okay, the coarse particles being piled up over here. And what is this closed circuit that I mentioned to you before? We can see it right here. Okay, when we talk that a circle, and when we say that this is a circle, it's closed. What I mean by this is the material came from this machine to this one, and then it can goes back to the same machine. So if you take a look, we have a look over here. It's a closed loop, and that's why we call this closed circle. And it's quite important for us to evaluate the circulating load because normally, you have something like 250% of circulating load. What this means, if I'm going to feed new material, new feed, one ton, I'm going to have 2.5 tons coming back to the same machine as circulating loading. And if you think that this is a lot, just consider this. In Catalan, in our two phosphate companies, our circulating loading is around 600% and not only 250. Why? To avoid to break more of our material that we actually needed. Okay, so we can have something called like under breakage of the material and over breakage. Okay, and we don't want to have over breakage because if you have over breakage, then you spend more energy than you should, and then you're going to have a lot of slimes, and these slimes for us is just garbage. So we're going to have to throw it out away. Okay. So this is our bar or ball mill, okay? Why or? And why this name, bar and ball? First of all, it is a tube and it is rotating, okay? So that's why in some language or cultures, you can see this is a revolving tubular mill. But what we put inside of the mill, it is important because that goes the mill's name. Okay. Actually, we have other differences between bar and ball mill. I'm going to show you guys in a little bit, but it's quite regular. If you take a look in the mill like this, it's to be or a bar or a ball mill. Okay. Normally, for the geometry, this would be a bar mill. Okay. Why bar? Because you put bars, rods inside of the mill. So another way to call this would be rod mill. Okay, so bar mill or rod mill would be the same. Okay? And these rods are made of steel. Normally, we can have something like chromium steel. And specific mass would be around 7.5 up to 8 grams per cubic centimeters. And the length of the bar, it's almost the length of the mill. So you avoid at all costs, have different size of the bars, because otherwise the bars can start to have, mix together and even fuse together. And then you lose all of your load in the mill, you have to stop the mill and cut out the bars off the mill. So it take you a lot of energy and time to reclaim this material from your mill. So again, use or try to use as much as you can the bars the same size of the mill and we can have the same geometry of the mills used 
with balls inside of it, again, steel balls, but we can also have different grinding medias, not only steel. We're going to talk a little bit about that in a few minutes. But normally, when you talk about ball mill, it would be not as wide as the bar mill, which means a little bit shorter than the ball mill, than the, sorry, the rod mill, okay? But nevertheless, you can have this standard configuration for both of them. And what is the difference between those? Normally, we use rod mill or bar mill when you have material coming straight from the crushing or the crushing facility. So the first stage of milling normally would be in this kind of equipment. It can break your material in a very nice way, considering that you still have coarse particles and ball mill can't do this for you. Okay, so if you have your material already fine, then you can go straight to the ball mills. Otherwise, you're gonna still having these coarse fractures because ball mill is going to break by impact, but normally you have a lot of shear stress inside of it. And that's why you're gonna remain have bigger particles and bar mill on the other hand can do the trick, okay? So this is another shot coming from Catalan. This is our bar mill. And this items that you can see over here, this is a, those are bolts, okay, nuts and bolts. It's because inside of the mill, we have also liners and those liners were designed to prevent any kind of damage to your mill body, okay? So instead of losing the whole body, losing your alloy, okay, and have like micro fractures of the mill, you put the liners and the liners can do the trick, okay? The liners also help you with another thing, which will be the trajectory that you want to the, the grinding media have inside of the mill. You need the grinding media to reach up to certain height and then fall. And by doing this, you have the breakage of your material, okay? And the liner can help you with that. It can provide you the right angle and also the profile of the liner that you use can have this effect more pronunciated or even less pronunciated. So you choose the liner in a very smart way in order to low down the energy consumption and on the other hand, have the maximum of the mineral breakage as you want, okay? Do you remember the trommel guys from the last lecture for the classification? Take a look, this is another trommel, okay? And why I'm showing you guys trommel right now if we're talking about mills, because the best application nowadays for trommels are milling, okay? But how we're gonna have a mill and a trommel working together? Well, first of all, I need an engine to make the trommel spinning around, okay? So instead of having an engine only for the trommel, why not attach the trommel directly to the end of the mill? If I do this, I already have the trommel spinning around. The energy is going to be almost the same, okay? The trommel waits nothing for the mill. And by attaching the trommel, I can do something quite wise. Normally, the ball mill is going to throw out balls of it, okay? So part of the grinding media is going to exit the mill. This is not desired, but it's quite normal. So it's regular. All the facilities have this. But when you attach a trommel like this, instead of losing your steel balls and end up having this on your hydrocyclones, the trommel can retain the used steel ball mills. And then you just put these balls in a separate container, and then you're gonna choose, or you can put the, mill, the balls back into the mill, or you can just sold that for recycling, okay? So when we take a look at this mill over here, we can clearly see the trommel, okay? But coming back to this one, you can see that in here, we have this structure that reminds us the trommel, and normally we have the trommel attached, and also protected, as you can see over here by this cap, okay? So again, coming back to that picture that I left before, that's the trommel that we're going to attach right in the end of our ball mill, okay? It's pointless to have this for a rod mill, okay? But definitely it's a very good acquisition for a ball mill. I know one example that people attach the trommel in the end of a rod mill, and when I got there, I was 
quite confused why you have a trommel in the end of your rod mill because it doesn't make a lot of points because you're not going to lose bars in the end of your milling process and also if you take a look at the aperture over here for this trommel it had to be quite big in order to allow your material to go through the trommel and not be retained to the trom on the trommel and then they came to me and said yeah the problem is here in our company we have a lot of organic material our material coming straight for the mine came with roots even leaves and things like that and we have also plastic contaminations for the, the blasting and we need to take those out if we feed our next stage a communication stage we have a hydrocyclone first so our closed circuit is not the first milling stage but the second one but instead of feeding our material direct to the second mill and from the mill to the hydrocyclones we we, we fed our material straight to the hydrocyclones because we have a lot of fines so if we remove the trommel i'm gonna be putting in our hydrocyclones first organic matter matter sorry and second plastics and that's a nightmare for hydrocyclones and it's quite clever i was able to see the guys opening the cap and show me the the trommel inside and we definitely could see some roots and some organic matter and a lot of plastics so yeah that is a, even those kind of application to this equipment and if you have something in your backyard or something around in your company why not put all these guys in good use okay so just attach the equipment and let's see what's going to happen okay and in this case we have a very good result trust me it was very good to have this strong on board again some pictures from the brazilian mining companies specifically catalon and as you can see over here we need a lot of mills and a lot of milling and this unit over here this mineral processing plant it's fed with 400 tons per hour we have actually two mineral processing plants one by the other side and we split the feed for these two so everyone receives something around 400 tons per hour okay it's not a very big mineral processing plant but nevertheless it's important so in here we can take a very good look at one example it's not the only one but it's one example of a closed circuit okay so in this case it's a little bit different than what we expect because we have a, a dry system okay and that's why i was quite impressed and decided to bring this to you guys to see it's a dry mill and you can do this okay you can grind your material without using any water but the water it can increase your grinding or your milling capability how if you want to have fine product you have to use water okay so at the beginning you can imagine but if i add water part of my energy is going to be delivered to the water and not to the minerals and that's exactly the opposite it's quite strange i know okay but you can make the math and you're gonna see that the water being there you have a better mechanism to deliver the energy from the grinding media to your ore and that's why you need water if you want to reach fine particles okay and on the other hand you use water in order to remove heat from your system if you don't put water your meal can go up to like 80 degrees celsius or even more and when we stop the mill and we go inside of it just to change the lines the liner of the mill some mills are just laying around in the sun okay and then you can reach like 50 degrees celsius 60 degrees celsius inside of the mill because you don't have any window it's a very narrow area okay and it's all made of steel so yes in a place like catalon that you can easily reach 40 degrees celsius the mill is going to be like 20 up to 40 degrees higher than the, the surroundings environment okay so that's why we put water by doing this we can cool down the mill also okay and on the other side you can even prevent some uh, runoff of the liners okay so you can preserve also your liners but depending on the liners material you can have 
oxidation and even rusting of these liners. So yeah, you have some downside of using water as well. Okay, but in this case, what we're seeing right here, the material exit our mill, go to an air classifier. Okay, so the first one is an air classifier. And after this air classifier, we have a cyclone. Okay, so, but in this case, it would be an air cyclone. Okay, and the coarse particles in this case come back to the mill and the fine particles, it looks like it's coming back to the mill, but it's not. They're coming right here and then it goes away in the process. Okay, so here it is a very good example of a closed circuit. If we add water to this it would be almost the standard closed circuit that we use around the world. Okay, so this is standard. Many companies use the same technology. It works. Okay, it works quite well. And when I mentioned to you before that we have a circulating load in Catalan around 600%, and I know it's surprising, but now you can understand this better. It's easy for us to have the material go into the mill, stay a small amount of material over there, so the residence time would be very short, and then we check the material if they agree with our standard or not. And if we don't have the material in the particle size distribution that we want, we ship it back to the mill. But if we will ever have products, then we can just go to the next stage. Because if we try to do the opposite, then we're gonna end up with a lot and lots and lots of slimes in our hand, okay? And probably the next st stage is going to be desliming, okay? and you don't have a lot of don't want to have a lot of slimes in your hand because then again you just throw in away money okay so let's move away from these slimes but you guys if you want to have a very good research project if you want to do your masters your phd's and so on okay go for fine particles concentration okay if we develop a routes or new equipments in order to allow us to flotate or even to concentrate in another way, fine particles, then you're going to be billionaire, okay? Like very, very rich. So that's very good subject for you to study, okay? I'm trying to do my part over that, but when you reach a certain size of the particles, then everything is going to be even more complicated than before. Flotation by itself, it's already complicated, but flotation of very fine particles, it's too complicated. Okay, and I'm gonna show you guys. So, those are the ball mills, the, sorry, the steel balls that I mentioned to you before. We can actually work with different uh, grinding media or mill media. We can even have something like ceramics. We can have pebbles, natural pebbles. We can even use different kind of alloys. Okay, but actually, steel balls are the cheapest one they are around they're completely available everywhere in brazil you can find this there again they're very cheap and you can also sell your used balls for recycling and it's quite good okay so if you don't have any kind of problems with iron contamination in your material definitely go for steel balls okay but if iron is a problem for you for example we're starting to work with quartz for PV, photovoltaic voltaic panels, we don't wanna have iron, okay? So our iron contamination has to be zero. And then we're going to use aluminum grinding media and it's expensive, okay? You have to have extra careful on how to use those and they break and it's quite expensive compared to the steel balls, okay? If you can, go for steel balls if you can't change your media okay so this is a picture taken from inside of a mill you can see the liners over here okay and that's why i mentioned to you before that they are quite important because according to the position of the lining the material of the lining you can have a better result in your mill as you can see over here the mill is going to be turning around in that way anti-clockwise and the material is going to be held over here, okay? And then the material will start to go up, 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 and then it falls down and break the material inside of the mill. And that's what we want. We want to have this. 
And this is a simulation just to show you guys how important it is to have the correct angle from the grinding media and the material inside of our mill to do what? To do the best breakage system that we can have, okay? The blue area over here, over there, it's a call it a dead area, dead zone. You don't have breakage inside of that area. So we want to minimize that area as much as possible and we want to have this free falling material. And by doing this, we can have more energy being delivered to our minerals. And then, as you can see over here, the power draw from the mill is going to be more wisely used, okay? So many ways on how we can simulate this. And I'd like to call your attention to the name in the in the right corner over here of this presentation. It's called Eden. Eden is a company from the UK and they have this amazing simulator software. You can simulate everything that you you can imagine and they they use the principle they use to solve the equation that's the, the eden that i mentioned to you before is molecular dynamics okay so they use this molecular dynamics and also they, they use discrete element method so you can choose between one or the other you can choose what kind of package do you want to use to solve your equations okay so this is one of the last meals that i want to show you guys i want to introduce to you guys this is also a vsi a vertical system but this is called vertimil this is coming from metso this picture was shot by me in the beginning of two years ago but not the last year but the year before i was i was going to say last year this pandemic is driving all of us crazy and without history notion anymore. But this is Anglo-American iron, and it's also situated in Minas Gerais. And they have this, but these mills, and it's quite strange. When I arrived there, I was mesmerized by this mill because I looked to the company and said, okay, that's a primary crusher, that's the secondary crusher, the primary mill, the secondary mill, and that's flotation. Okay, we have hydrocyclones in the middle, but that's flotation. And after the flotation, I was seeing that kind of mills. And I was intrigued. Why do we have not one, two, three? They have like eight mills. Okay, you can see the first four. But on the other hand, on the, the back of the picture, you have four more. Okay, and I was thinking, why? Why do you have more of this? And one thing that came to my mind, and this is quite something normal we, we can do this is a regrinding of or remilling of your material when you're in a flotation stage i'm going to show you guys this when we talk about flotation so you have a rougher flotation a cleaner flotation and you take the material coming out of the cleaner and then you regrind the material in order to increase the liberation and then you float again and that wasn't the case because i could see that the material coming out of the mill was just going away from the company. They are actually putting this material in their ore duct and just shipping the material out of the company. And then I asked the guys over there, why are you doing this? And they said, oh, because the material is too coarse to be shipped by a duct. So we need to regrind the material in order to transport the material. And that's why they have this specific application. So for fine material and to produce very very fine materials this kind of vertical mill it's one option okay so this is one of the possibilities that's not the one coming from metsu as you can see you have a vertical shaft it's spinning around and you just add your material on the top and the material is going to fall down and then eventually break that's not the case that's not the equipment that we have on anglo we have something like this okay so in here you can see that you have a spiral inside of the equipment the material is fed on the lower part of the equipment and this spiral is going to drive the material the minerals up in order to break the material so you still have balls inside of it you have steel balls and the friction between the spiral and the steel balls and the ore is going to be responsible for break the ore in the fractions very very fine okay and one other thing that is quite clever in this kind of mill is if you try to do what i mentioned 
just like this okay you have water you have mineral you have steel balls and you have inside of that a spiral moving around and the minerals and the balls have to go up you're gonna have a very very high wear off of your spiral and also off your liners okay then the guys have this brilliant idea they want to feed in the beginning only steel balls to this machine and they're going to produce a magnetic field around the machine okay so this wall over here is going to be a magnetic wall and the same over here so what's going to happen part of the steel balls is going to be attached to the wall because of this magnet field and then you start the machine and then you introduce your rod okay so instead of having lining you just let the ball mills became your lining okay? and that's very clever very clever and save you a lot of money okay so guys for now that's what i want to tell you about mills it's a very quick introduction we're going to come back to this equipment in the future but now i want to tell you a little bit about mine to mill okay this concept is not new it's been around for a few decades it started in australia in the end of the, the 80s beginning of the 90s it is going to be some different people were going to say that it's big it started on the on the new millennium like in the two the 20s something but actually you have some papers from the 90s and the idea of mine to mill sorry it will be something like that instead of just taking a look at your company like links in a chain we're going to take a look in, in a more broad view okay i'm going to take a look in all the elements but i'm going to start to connect elements and then one thing that i draw a lot of attention was how can i increase the mill performance okay and then people come came and said oh that's easy if you want to have a better mill just have a better crusher okay that makes a lot of sense i'm going to crush more my material so i'm going to have more easily time with the mill okay but then people from the crushing plant said okay yeah it's quite easy if you say the problem is mine but how about crushing how can i have then a better crusher and then point fingers i said okay give me a better ore coming from the mine of course and then people from the mine said okay but i can do this i can work out with this and then mine to mill initiative is started so the idea behind mine to mill was let's take a look a found look a deeper look not into the the links but also between the connections between those links okay i know that connection and link in the same sentence sounds strange but for example let's take a look at this let's consider this okay what's going to happen with the mill if i reduce the amount of explosives and we do this okay we try this we're going to reduce the explosives and we're going to take a look at the mill and of course the, our mill is going to be a terrible terrible situation okay and then let's increase the explosives and by doing this by doing this test work we can end up having a best configuration not just to blast the material and to ship the material but to mill the material and nowadays almost all companies they have this idea okay we don't blast the material to transport we blast the material to mill the material okay and that's why this idea is so young because back in the time, the only function of the explosives would be to break the material, literally to break loose the material in order to allow us to transport the material. And that's not the case anymore. Okay? We don't transport the material itself. We transport the material in order to break the material even more. So it makes a lot of sense if people from the mills goes together with people from the crushing and do we all have a very good dialogue with people from the blasting okay so i think it was to uh, yeah definitely it was the 2012 uh, we have an, a specialization course here in brazil in our university we have this almost every year it's like 18 months special, specialization course in mineral processing and start next year we're gonna have this fully online okay we're gonna have this available to everyone around the globe eventually 
And then one of the students, he came to me and said, Professor, can you supervise me in, in a, something related to my interview? And I said, why? I can't do this, but why you want to do this? He said, yeah, because when I came to Catalon, I, I came to work in the mine. Okay, I have no connection with, with mineral process. I don't even like too much mineral processing. But people from the company, they demand me to have a specialization. They want me to have this title. So the only one that I had available right now, connected to something to, me, to mines, was yours. So that's why I'm here being a student of mineral processing. I don't like mineral processing, I don't work with mineral processing, but I want to be here. I need to be here, actually. I need to keep my job. And this guy was coming from 2,000 kilometers away from here, in the north, uh, east part of the Brazil. Very good student, Paulo. And I told him, okay, let's do something. And we studied copper brass system for one year. Okay? And we performed a lot of tests. And in the end, we present this for a copper brass board. And they look at that and said, okay, so what do you say here in a few sentences is, if we put more money in the blasting, in the drilling in the blasting, okay, and you want more money for this, we're going to save money in the meeting. And we said, yes, definitely. And they asked us, how much money you want to put there and how much money I'm going to get from there? And we came with these numbers. It would be something like this for every dollar, extra dollar that you put it in the blasting slash uh, uh, drilling, so drilling slash blasting, you're gonna have back something around 60 cents of uh, savings with the mill. Okay, so you put one dollar and you get back six, cash back 60 cents. And then we had another student over there in the same meeting and he came to us and said, okay, and if what else, if I do the opposite, what if I put $1 in our meal? I said, okay, we ran the math also. We try to do this. For every dollar that you put in the meal, you only have back five cents. Okay, so that's the difference. So $1, 60 cents, $1, five cents, okay? So to summarize this lecture today is if you want to spend money, go for the blessing, okay? Spend your money in the blessing, have a better blessing, a better drill, okay? Go for a, a more closed grid, made a lot of drills, blast wisely your material, and it's going to save you a lot of time, a lot of trouble, and a lot of money in the end when you have to build your material, okay? Do your blasting on your way and you're going to have a lot of problems in order to commute to your material okay and that summarize a little bit about mine to mill i'm going to show you guys another approach that it's another name and it's quite trendy in, in the mineral area it's called geometallurgy but i'm going to let this to the end because geometallurgy it's again a very broad way so i'm going to take a look at the whole mining and mine system okay and sometimes people don't like to have this huge approach. They like to go this part by part. So go to mine to me. So if you don't have anything in your company, any optimization, go for mine to me. It's easy to implement. Okay, it's reliable. We have many study cases around. We have, we had. Nowadays we're gonna have back a conference in Australia, organized by Ausmin and it's called uh, mean plant it will be like a mineral processing plant but we have also another one that is focusing only on meal operations okay and if you go in the conference like that nowadays or if you take the proceedings and take a look so you're going to see a dozens a lots of mine to meal projects again people this works okay it is solid you can invest your money and you're not going to regret okay and again it's just a philosophy it's how you deal with this so what we did in copper brass back in the time was so good that we applied for a brazilian award that is this award that is given every year for the most initiative projects and we call this like mining excellence and we won 
okay? We won the mining excellence in 2013. It's just like, it was almost just in time. We finished the project, we made this presentation and we applied and we got it. Okay, so, so far we had two projects with this company, two big projects, and we score the mining excellence twice in Brazil nowadays. Okay, one with flotation, also with milk and flotation, and the other one with mine to milk. So the first prize that we got, the first award that we got was from the blasting to the mill, and the second one was put the mill inside of the flotation, that regrinding that I mentioned to you. So I'm gonna show you guys these papers. I'm gonna send you guys these papers to take a quick look. I think it worked. And I think you're gonna like it too much, okay? So to summarize this, put a little bit more effort in this kind of ideas or uh, ways to work your ore, and definitely you're gonna save a lot of energy and you're gonna save a lot of time, okay, eventually. And the cheapest energy that we have in our hands when you talk about mining is related to explosives, okay? So if you have a problem because your material is too hard, you can't just mill it or grind it, go for explosives, okay? So just always remember this. I have a problem with communication, take a look at the explosives, okay? Or there is arriving very big blocks of the material, take a look at the explosives it's going to be your best friend for now on. But by doing this, definitely, definitely, you can end up solving part of your problems, okay? So again, I'd like to thank uh, not only Andifis for the, this initiative, but also I'd like to thank my university, Federal University of Catalão, my lab, which is this one, Lampi Min, which be translated as uh, research and modeling lab in mineral processing so please feel free to take a look at our website we have our capabilities over there our youtube channel and if you have any questions i would be glad to address those okay so guys feel free to ask whatever you want please Ramon, do you have any questions? Diane, Santiago, Barbara, we have some time for questions. Okay. Um, Go ahead, Ramon. Okay. okay. So, um, uh, when you were talking about the um, uh, the gyratory um, and to come back when you when you said Catalan Arasha is, is close to each other. Oh, very good question. Okay, uh, I'm gonna do this. Okay, next lecture I'm gonna put a little bit about the Brazilian uh, maps. Okay, but let me do something different. Let me show you guys a little bit about the Brazilian geography and. We're not close, okay, considering European standards, okay, for European standards, we're not close, but if you consider like the Brazilian standards for distance, that, yeah, we're close, like 200 kilometers away. Uh, I'm just guessing 200, I'm going to show you guys a little bit exactly in a second, so let me share a different screen with you. Okay, so... Let's go to this. I like this software over here. So we all know this, right? So this is Google Earth. And let me show you Catalan, okay? So this is Catalan over here, okay? I, I'm going to zoom out. It's going to show you my home doing like this. Okay? Yeah, my home is around here, okay? So this is the city center. Oh, just for you to know, that's the mining companies. So as you can see, this is Catalan, okay? And this is the company's mining over here. So you have this one and you have this complex over here, okay? So here are the main complex. So let me zoom out a little bit, okay? So I can even remove the grids. That's going to make you feel better, see better. I'm not sure why it's not put in the States. Mm, yeah, Google Earth. 
it wasn't very good for me right now. So let me see if I can just put more information over here. I can put this. Yeah, let me change to to Google Maps. I think it's going to be better than this. I can turn off the terrain, but it's not going to give me the same effect that I wanted. So just one second, okay? Let me change over here to Google Maps. I think it's going to be easier. But at least we, we could see a little bit where are the mines here in Catalan, okay? So let me stop over here and change in here. So I ask for a route from company to company, okay? Uh, okay, so this is Arasha and I want it from Catalan to Arasha. Direction. Oops. Arasha. I told you for 200 kilometers, 208 kilometers, okay? So in here we can see a little bit about the state. So this is Minas Gerais state, this is Goiás state, and that's the distance from Catalão to Arasha. You have to go, for example, to Uberlândia, that's one of the cities over here, and then go to Arasha. Oh, it's not far away, but it's quite similar regarding the geology. Okay, You have an alkaline complex over here, and you have almost the same alkaline complex over here. You have niobium in Arasha, you have niobium in Catalão, phosphate in Arasha, phosphate in Catalão. Monazite in Arasha, not so much in Catalan. Okay, we don't have so much monazite in Catalan, but we do have some monazites in Catalan. You have barite Arasha, you have the same in Catalan. So the geology it's similar. It's not the same, but it's similar. And when you talk about tapira and other complex that we have also phosphate rock, they would be near this area from Uberaba and into São Paulo. And then we have also a few more companies around Sao Paulo, okay? And when we talk about that area in Minas Gerais that we have the iron ore, it would be this area around Belo Horizonte. So further, okay? But when we talk about Carajás, it's up on Pará, okay? So it would be near here. Let me just show you guys, Carajás, okay? So would be here. And then it's far, 1,748 1, kilometers. Like one whole day driving to get there. It's not, it's not close. So we have iron ore right over here too. So that's Brazil. It's quite big. Okay. And if you take a look at this, you can have an, a picture, a, quick, a clear picture or how big is Brazil regarding our neighbors? <laughs> it's really big. Yeah, that's right. So, um, yeah. what, when, uh, when you was uh, talking about uh, the trauma, trauma screen, and you you talk about uh, the like wood and uh, so I, I was and I was I. I was working in a company, uh, uh, I am Gold, and, and in my period, the, the name was uh, Cambior. And we, we, in that period, we didn't have a, a screen after the ball map. So, in the stretch screen, before the, before the, the thick map, we had a lot of problem with woods. Because why are you talking about uh, this combination to uh, stress, uh, no, trauma, trauma screen, I thought, wow, we couldn't, uh, uh, if, uh, if the company know of uh, company uh, knows how to, to, to use uh, the trauma screen, it will be better for the, no. the leads. What can I tell you about this? Go to every single conference that you can, okay? So I would love, I would love to go every year to SME conference in the United States. It's huge. 
I, I've been once when I was in Denver, Colorado, and that is another huge conference also in Canada. That's the biggest one in the world, I guess. Brazil, we have one. Every two years, it's going to be in Belo Horizonte. It's like this, one year in Belo Horizonte, another year in, in Pará, in Nor or Amazonas. I think it's more on Amazonas. And I haven't attended this one in Amazonas, not yet. I, I want to go, but I, I couldn't yet. And it's amazing how much different equipments you're going to find over there. Okay, So there are pendular mills, there are different uh, structures and even different ideas for the same equipment that we have in the past. So you, you get there and you take a look at so this is a jaw crusher. And then the guy came to you, yeah, this is a jaw crusher, but we have this innovation and this other innovation and these other things. And you can say, oh, very clever. Okay, you're going to solve a lot of problems by doing this. So go there, because if you take a book, a book is going to require like a year or two to be ready. Okay, and then the author is going to take like four years to give you another edition of the book. Papers are faster, definitely, you can go for papers, but sometimes you, you can't just find the right paper to allow you to buy a new equipment. Because it's strange for me, I, I think it's really strange, but here in Brazil you have many PhDs working in companies, okay? in manufacturer companies, they work as a sailors, but on sales, but when you talk with these guys and ask them, how many papers are you publishing? I said, none. But that's quite strange because if you produce a paper and you publish a paper, a real paper, scientific, scientific one, people are going to read it. And probably they're going to come and say, oh, this is good. Okay, I'm going to try this machine. And that's what it's happened, for example, nowadays with AGPGR. If you take papers from Chile, you're going to see a lot of papers coming from AGPGR. I went to a conference in Peru. It was like this. I went in a year and then I, I got in touch with the proceedings two years later. Okay. So the year that I was there, it would be something like 10 papers on ball mill for one paper on AGPGR. Two years later, it was the opposite. 10 papers coming only on HPGR for one per paper or one paper regarding ball mill. And you got to be updated. You got to be always learning new things. Okay. So if you want to remain in the mineral sector, keep learning. Okay. So what I learned today, what I'm going to learn this month, what I'm going to learn this year, keep learning. Okay. If you have problems studying by yourself, then just go for another courses, attend some other courses and so on. But definitely, definitely keep studying. Okay. And by doing this, you're going to see a lot of new equipment and then you just connect the dots. Okay. Oh, people are doing this. Just let's do this differently. And I went to a company once and I saw on a vibratory screen, a lot of organic material, lots. And I came to them and said, what are you doing about this? I said, yeah, it is a problem because everything that we try, we can't remove this organic matter. And I, I asked them, can I make a, a test work with those? And they said, yeah, if you want, be my guest. And then they took me to see how much organic material they have. And it was amazing. It was like piles and piles and piles. Okay, And they end up having piles of this material. And I did two things. First of all, I tried the trauma and it worked very nice, worked like a charm. And then we took this material, we compressed this material and we kind of burned the material in order to make coal. Okay. And then we have coal briquettes and the people from the company said, it's quite good because I need energy. I need thermal energy for one process downstream and I have to buy this coal. So if I can produce my own coal, it would be amazing. I said, yeah, just do this. And they was okay, let's do this. And it was very nice that we could actually went there a few years later and we could see the technology working over there. And the guys were very, very impressed and satisfied with that. Yeah, just sometimes a simple idea, Ramon, 
can save you a lot of money okay so again i'm gonna ask you guys to watch like golden rush okay so if you see the guys doing that like at the Zeno minds you, you can have a lot of ideas on how things work because people it's normal when you're working in the mine things are going to break machines are going to stop you have to make repairs like right away okay and sometimes you you're working with something and you don't know how to solve it and then you just ask a clever person and the person just solve your problem in a such a sophisticated and at the same time easy way that you're going to be very very impressive i just want to to tell you a quick story about catalan also catalan it's full of history and also full of stories and it was about uh, a mill line uh, well, there was a time that people stopped the plant and they were going to change the liners inside of the mill and by doing this you have to stop the whole plant okay so you halt the production and you don't have another way you have to do this okay you have to stop the mill so a lot of preparation many people knowing about this everything said they just stopped the mill and they put people inside of the mill to remove the liners okay so it's not a very good thing to do but nevertheless you have to do it so you went there and you start to remove the plates the liners and they remove part of the liners because you have to remove install the new ones and then spin a little bit the, the mill okay that's the process so when they are going to reinstall the first row of liners they saw something quite strange because the liners they didn't fit they were a little bit shorter just a little bit shorter than the previous one so when you put one liner and you put the second one they have to fit together okay like zero space between them and there was a gap a few centimeters but there was a gap and then they were desperate because they couldn't just put the liners back the used ones because they are worn so they need new liners and they couldn't just call someone and okay do you have liners delivered i'm gonna take the full pack so that's impossible take months to deliver and they were like desperate and then one clever idea, guy he had this idea how about we just stuck something in the middle let's just put something in this gap and they start to think what what we're we gonna put in the middle of the gap in order to just glue the plates together yeah. and they went for epox resin we have this dura epox in brazil so it's just two resins you mix together and you have this gray paste and you just apply it and 24 hours later it's going to be like a rock it's going to be very very hard and they did it and people was just making fun of them oh that's not going to work uh this dura epox doesn't doesn't get the heat so this is going to come out of the law the, the meal and so on and so on so they put it they wait for the cure they restart the meal everything was okay the power draw was okay so let's do it and they operate the meal until the next stop okay the next planet stop and when they arrive there and when they took a look at the liners and the solution they were impressed they took pictures i have a few but the resolution is too low they are impressed because the liners went off they're all worn but the dura box were still there <laughs> like intact so yeah it works okay it works like the asha the problem was when they remove the liners they have to take hammer and they have to scissor and they have to break all of the epox resin so it took them a long time to apply and to remove but beside that it was a perfect solution okay so yeah guys you you have to learn how to deal with these situations and it is what it is you're gonna end up in the middle of the jungle to do mining you don't have many resources, and you have to start up a company and you have to run a company and if something breaks you fix it it is what it is okay but i love this okay every time in my lab 
I try to do the maintenance myself. Today, I stay the whole day doing this, and I love this. So every day is a new challenge because almost every week something breaks. Okay. Yes. Okay, Hamon. Okay. Hope yes. that it answered yeah. your question. Yes, nice. I, I, I was planning, uh, I think, uh, uh, in 2000, of last year, uh, I think, uh, yeah, it was last year, in Cat it's, I'm not sure if it's Catalan, or, but I in Goyas, they should have a meeting. Uh, I was planning to go there for the meeting, it was uh, more about, uh, equipment, mineral equipment, and uh, it was all my, my planning, but the COVID. That's so right, I, we had we had this conference, that's right. You, you're right, we have this conference. It was planned for last year. Unfortunately, the pandemic was terrible for them, but actually we had nowadays two conference in Goiás State regarding mines. The first one was 2013 because we have a, a national encounter of mineral process, a national meeting on mineral processing every two years. And we call this ANTME, it's National Encounter of Mineral Process and Extractive Metallurgy. And in 2013, I was the president of this conference and we held, those, uh, held this conference in Goiânia, our capital. And last year we had a slightly different one. It wasn't focused on mineral process as you described it, but in equipment, but I couldn't attend. I decided also not to go because of the pandemic. It was too early to go there and to do this kind of conference. I'm still afraid to, to go to conference even now. Okay. But yes, I think last, last, next year, we're gonna be on the road again. We can wait a little bit more. Maybe next year it will be in Rio de Janeiro. Yes, the next one, the next Enchimi is going to be in Rio de Janeiro. That's right. You're most right. It's supposed to be this year because Enchimi happens on even years. So it, sorry, uneven years. That's why it's supposed to be this year. But we decided to postpone this to next year because of the pandemic. Okay. So yes, you're most correct. The, the last one was in Belo Horizonte and we selected Rio de Janeiro for the next one and for the next one it's going to be Rio Grande do Sul it's going to be in Gramado probably okay it's connected to Porto Alegre so you guys are most welcome and invited to come to Brazil to present your papers you can present in Portuguese Spanish or even English and it's a very good conference it's the biggest conference on mineral processing and extractive metallurgy of Brazil so by association it's the biggest in the South America uh, and yeah it's quite a good conference okay. I've been attending this conference for decades right now and every single one I attended I just missed one because I was in Germany and I couldn't come I was living in Germany for a year but beside that every every single one of those uh, I do the best that I can to be there so, yeah. Yes, I, I, I was in MBH. Oh, really? Yes. So we were in the same place. So we probably <laughs> crossed in the hall, hallways, but I yeah. I didn't know you. Yeah, I presented. I think I didn't present any papers. My students were presenting that year and people were coming to me asking why you're not presenting anything. No, I, nowadays, I'm just going to watch papers and just let my students do the, the work. So I think in Belo Horizonte was the first time that I didn't present anything. Okay. Uh, and I was just accompanying my my students and seeing their own research being presented. But yes, okay. I was there. I was there too. Okay. okay. So, so guys, do you have any other questions or anything from you? The feedbacks, suggestions, doubts, anything? I have no doubt it's a good point uh, about the mindfulness. Um, I agree with you and you have to do first about thank Okay, you. thank you. Okay, go ahead then, please. No, I don't, I don't have enough to do it. Okay, thank you. 
so guys, if you don't have any extra questions, I thank you all for attending this lecture. We're going to finish now and we come back next Friday for more mineral processing. And then we're going to see concentration. Okay. If we're going to have time, we're going to also talk about dewatering. Otherwise, we're going to have another lecture. Okay. So thank you guys and see you on our next meeting. Bye-bye.